right to our message and um, get started. I have to um, thank those that have been responding to the note in the bulletin about needing help in the sound room. Um, Randy's back there today learning the computer and I went in and harassed him right away and so he, he begged forgiveness in case things get fouled up today but I'm pretty confident that they'll go well so thank you randy for filling in and those others that have come and filled in as well anybody who's interested in learning um, it's pretty simple operation back there and we've had a couple folks that have dropped out of the loop so we're still needing some help to fill in the more people that fill in uh, the less often everyone has to serve and if you note you don't see my husband's pretty little face because he's in there all the time right now so i i will unabashedly uh, promote getting some more help in there if we can so well today our lesson comes from the book of james anybody spend any time in the book of james it's a great book in the bible and um, if you'll flip through your bible you'll find that the name james is pretty common in fact, we, you know, it, it, that's where it gets really confusing in the Bible, especially to new Christians or new explorers, is because they go through and they say, oh yeah, I read this about Herod, well, which Herod? Or I read this about James, well, which James? So I thought it might be best to start out today and break down some of the, boy, I'm crackling today, um, break down some of the basic um, James people show up in the Bible and then we can talk about uh, which one wrote the book of James. So first of all, there was James, the son of Zebedee. He's your guy in the upper left corner, okay? And uh, he is the brother of John, John that wrote the book of John and John 1 and John 2, etc., okay? Um, he was a fisherman who was called by Christ to be a disciple. He and his older brother, John, were nicknamed by Christ as the sons of thunder. Hmm. Is that a favorable thing? Well, probably not so much because they, those guys together were extremely impulsive. They did some interesting things. And so... Christ called them the sons of thunder. Um, this James was the first disciple to give his life for Christ when he was killed by Herod in 44 AD. This is the upper left-hand James, okay? Um, this is not the James that we're going to talk about today, not the one that wrote the book. Next, we're going to talk about James, the son of Alphaeus. And he's in the upper right corner, I believe. Yes, upper right corner. He's another disciple, although there's not very much that's known about him, not many writings about him. Some students of scripture have written some things, think that he might have been the brother of Matthew, but they're not sure. Nobody knows for sure. He's not the James that we're going to talk about today either. He's not the one that wrote the book. Then we have center bottom, James, father of the disciple Judas. Now, a very obscure person, this Judas was not the same as Judas Iscario, who betrayed Jesus, okay? So there's multiple Judases out there as well. Don't go home yet, I'm going to get to my point. <laughs> this James, bottom center, is... Not the James we're going to talk about today either. <laughs> Not the one that wrote the book. But finally, we're going to get to James, the brother of Jesus. Not to be confused with somebody that I tried to make a couple of weeks ago as the brother of Jesus. No, this guy, James, is the brother of Jesus, and he wrote the book that we're going to talk about today. Most likely, in fact, highly likely, almost undoubtable, he did write the book. He was one of seven of Jesus' siblings, brothers and sisters, and he was actually only a half-brother to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was fathered by God, 
the other children were fathered by an earthly husband to marry. Okay? James, like most of his siblings, did not believe their brother Jesus. They weren't followers of Jesus and his ministry. Um, they didn't think that Jesus was the Messiah at all when he was alive. Things changed down the road. But James did listen carefully, as did some of his other siblings, to what Jesus had to say. He would have been one of those guys on the outskirts, right, kind of hanging around in the bushes and listening and being a little critical and scratching his head and trying to figure out if it all made any sense. He followed Jesus' teachings, and he, along with several of us brothers and sisters, are noted as being present in the upper room the night before Jesus' crucifixion. Eventually, he was converted to being a believer after witnessing the crucifixion and then the resurrected Jesus. James penned his letter of encouragement and confidence to build that confidence to those who were Jews that were scattered throughout the land. At this point, when this was written, Jews were scattered everywhere, and they had a hard time pulling together. Think about if our fellowship just exploded and, they, and we were everywhere, it would be hard to pull together, right? And James recognized that, so he penned this writing actually in a letter and later turned into the book of James to encourage those Jews that were believers that were scattered throughout the land. So if you want to turn with me way in the back of your Bible to the book of James, the first chapter, verses 1 through 8, is what we're going to look at today. James 1, 1 through 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered amongst the nation, I send greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking for anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave on the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Glory to God. Boy, he kicks it right off the bat, doesn't he? Consider it pure joy when you face trials. You get that call from the doctor's office. You get that call from one of your children that lives at a distance. You get that call from a sibling. Everyone has gotten one of those calls, amen? How many times do we get one of those calls that we jump up and down for joy and say, oh, goody? No. But James says right here, consider it pure joy when you face trials. Is this guy nuts or what? It makes you wonder. Whoever says, let's go out and stir up some trouble in our lives. No one ever has said that. Yet, when we see it and we read it in context that James is on to something becomes really clear. God knows that that pain builds character, right? 
pain builds character within us. And character builds faith. So when we have faith, we will persevere. We become steadfast and we develop, even if I may say so, patience. Although it takes a little longer for some of us than others. My friends, we cannot really know the depth of our character until we see how we react when we're under pressure, right? We don't know. We coast along in life and things are good and we're doing our thing and all of a sudden that call comes in or the pressure starts on us and then the real true blue us comes out. It's so easy to be kind to others when everything is going well. Yeah, yeah. So easy when things are going well. But the question is, can we still be kind when others are treating us unfairly? Hmm. Oh, pastor, don't make me think about that. But it's true. How do we treat people all the time, no matter what the circumstances are? Or how about being kind and keeping our mouths shut when someone is yapping unkind words about us or about those that we care about? Uh-oh, now she goes to meddling. But it's true, right? Friends, God wants to make us mature and complete, but getting there is going to cause us some pain, maybe a lot of pain. God wants us to have wisdom. Remember we talked about wisdom recently, the last week or two? The difference between knowledge or book smarts and wisdom? The successful application of knowledge is what we then call wisdom. Wisdom can only come when we hang in there, when we persevere. It's the only way that we can gain wisdom. Has anybody here ever made an unwise decision? I won't ask for it. No, Connie says no. Wow. We need to all gather around her and lay on hands and see if we can get some of that. Maybe you made that unwise decision because you didn't take it to God first. When we need wisdom, we Christians don't have to grope around in the dark. We simply pray and God will supply our need. Now, I know a lot of you right there, your brain just stopped and said, oh no, that's not right. Hear me out. Hear me out. Not getting an answer when we pray and ask God means that we need to wait. He will answer in his own time. He will not leave us groping in the dark, hoping that we'll stumble upon the right answer. If you're not getting an answer, then God is simply saying, not right now or it's not your time but 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 it's how we react because we want it our way now the way that we have it laid out in our mind but that goes into a whole nother message right of how many times we've had something on our mind that we prayed for that we knew we had to have that we knew we had to do a place we needed to go and God didn't provide a way and we looked back and said, thank you, Jesus. Friends, God's wisdom is practical and divine and Christ-like. And when we persevere and relentlessly pursue God, he will supply our needs. I'll say it again our needs not our wants but our needs note in verse 6 
when James says, when you ask, you must believe in God's provision. Now that could go into a whole other message about asking because we think we ought to, but doing what we want to do anyway, even though we don't get the answer that we want or we don't get an answer at all. That, that could be a whole sermon series. I think I'll preach it to myself first. When you ask, James says, you must believe in God's provision. How many times have you tried everything else on your own before taking it to God? Don't try to count. We've all been there probably a million times if we could count it all. But let's admit it. We've done that time and time again. And yet, when we finally fall exhausted from the failure of trying to do it on our own, God is always there waiting patiently every single time. Remember last week or a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you the verse from James, James 4, 2. You have not because you ask not. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'll share a little story with you. At the start of our marriage, now keep in mind that's been 46 years ago now, so things economically were a little different than what they are these days, so put it into perspective. We were just at the start of the second year of our marriage and we moved our mobile home from a trailer park to a one acre rocky field out in the country and it seemed like a grand idea at the time. Mike and his dad hand pounded, anybody ever hand pound a well down with a big heavy thing? I think it was 22 foot deep was all the deeper we had to go to get water. But when you're taking it one pound at a time, that's pretty deep, right? We found a guy to put in a septic really cheap, and we were in business. Hook us up. We had our place. We were ready to go, sort of. We went off to work one day, and this was in about the end of September, 1st of October, about now, and it was starting to have a little weather change. And mobile homes in the early 70s were not built like mobile homes today. When it got cold outside, it was cold inside. So we called the local gas company, wasn't much competition at that time. We called the local gas company, they came out, and at that time, they provided your tank for free if you got your fills from them. And we told them, we've only got $100, and so don't, please don't put anything more than $100 worth of gas in, right? So we went off to work that day, and we knew that the gas tank was going to get filled, and we were going to come home and fire up the furnace and be warm and everything would be good. So we got home and the gas tank had been filled and we fired up the furnace and it started to warm up and everything was good until I discovered the bill from the gas man in the door. And they had filled the tank completely up. Now it was a 500 gallon tank. And I think gas then was, I don't know, 28 cents a gallon or something, but do the math. It was a lot more than the $100 than what we told them to put in. Well, I just sat down on the front step and put my head in my hands and just sobbed. Where were we going to get the money to make that happen? We didn't have any debt, but Lord knows we couldn't have afforded any either. Our, our meager incomes at that time, there was no way we could afford any payments. And that particular day, I checked in the checkbook, and we had three whole dollars. Three whole dollars and a hundred bill, hundred dollar bill from the gas company. I continued to sob, and Mike came along and tried to comfort and said, we'll figure this out. And then 
suddenly it came to me, I just needed to pray about this and say, you know, God, somehow this happened and you know our hearts and, you know, just, just God help us to take care of this, whatever your will is. Two days later, in our brand new mailbox sticking in that rocky yard out by the road, we got a check in the mail for $100. And it was for a rebate of like some unused lot rent or something from where we had just moved from, I don't even remember now. But it was exactly what we needed. We could pay the gas bill. We still only had $3 in the bank, but God was faithful because we persevered and believed that he would provide. James tells us in that scripture, believe and don't doubt. If you do, you're like waves tossed on the ocean. Hmm. Guess we don't even need that reminder, right? We know. We know. My friends, tough times won't last, but when God's people persevere, great things will happen. When we trust God and we don't let ourselves become tossed on that ocean of emotion, like James describes, God will come through, maybe not in a way that we would have thought, maybe not in the way that we asked for, but God will come through and protect his people who trust him. Great things are happening and great things will happen when we put all of our trust in God. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, James gives us a stark reminder about trusting you, about how regardless of our situation, you are there. And how, God, when we reach out to you and then truly give it to you and trust you for resolution, that when it's the right time, it will happen. God, be with us today as we come to the table of Holy Communion, as we come to share together in the body and the blood that was broken and shed for us. Be with us today and always. We pray it in your name. Amen. Just a reminder also that around the corner, Terry brought up the little offering for the children for the Heifer Project. If you remember, we said during Holy Communion Sundays, we would put that up. So if anyone has any spare change or that, that they would like to drop in to help the children out, we're trying to do that $500 match. And so um, appreciate anyone that can participate in that as well. That night in the upper room, as Jesus and the disciples gathered together, and when they had nearly finished eating and drinking, Jesus leaned over, and remember in, the, in my message today, I talked about that the disciples weren't the only one there. Jesus' brothers and sisters were there, his mother was there, and many other people from the community were there, although they weren't at the table per se. But many people were there. And Jesus leaned over and picked up an unbroken loaf of bread. He raised it up and he asked his heavenly father to give a blessing upon it. And then Jesus blessed it as well. And he said, this bread is the symbol of my body that will be broken for you on the cross at Calvary. I want you to take and I want you to eat of it and I want you to do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, he lifted the cup, held it up, and asked his heavenly Father to give a blessing. And then Jesus blessed it as well. And then he reminded them, this cup is the symbol of my blood that will be shed for you on the cross at Calvary. I want you to take, I want you to drink of it. I want you to do it in remembrance of me. Friends, it is a privilege to come to the table 
and remember the sacrifice that God gave. You don't need to be a member of this church or any United Methodist Church. We have an open table. If you believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, then these elements are for you. I've asked Terry and Dexter if they would come and help today. We invite you to come forward. Stay at the altar as long as you like. You can kneel or stand. You can return to your seats. There are little baskets at either end. So we invite you now to come forward and partake in the elements representing the body and the blood of Christ.
and all of God's people said. Let's stand together if you're able. And we're going to sing, Let's Just Praise the Lord. terrible thing could happen that we wouldn't lift our hands toward heaven and praise the Lord. He has given us so much, even through our trials and tribulations and even the no answers to prayer. He has given us so much. So we lift our hands to heaven and we praise the Lord. We thank him for his word in scripture. We take for granted the Bibles that we have in the pews, we take for granted um, having a plethora of Bibles. If you don't have one, go out to the shelf and pick one of probably 30 that are out there. And yet around the world, there are people starving for the word. Let's lift our hands toward heaven and praise the Lord. James says we have not because we ask not. And that we are tossed upon the seas when we don't ask God and entrust him for resolution. May God be with you in this week as it unfolds. Whatever happens, he's there. Whatever happens, he's in control. It's his design, and he'll be there on the other side when you come out, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, because he's a God that's the same yesterday, today, and always, and we praise him for it. God, we thank you for always being there and the reminder that we need to persevere in this world because the, those struggles are over when we've persevered, given our lives to you, and then come to you at heaven. So God, whatever this week throws at us, we're ready for it because we know that you are in it. We pray it in your precious and your holy name. Amen. Amen.